Welcome to the Business Bites Podcast, the podcast for busy entrepreneurs. Whether you're an online entrepreneur or seeking after brick and mortar success, this podcast brings you quick bites of content so you can learn and grow anywhere you are. Now here's your host, Rachel Brainkey. Hey guys, welcome to this episode of the Business Bites Podcast. I am your host, Rachel Branke, and today I'm joined with Sarissa Carlson from Sparkle Society. She is one of my favorite business consultants and online entrepreneurs. I absolutely dig and love her Facebook Lives and all the content that she has. She's also a fellow photographer. She owns Immerse Photography. She has been on the Creative Live stage, nationally published work, and she has thousands of sparkly photographers in her online communities. I absolutely love her encouragement, education, and empowerment as she's on the path to help you guys be more strategic and make more informed decisions for your business. So welcome. Thanks for joining us. Heck yeah. I am actually standing here with a big old stupid smile on my face because I think I have as much adoration for you as you do for me. So this is like all the feels already. We're just at the top of the broadcast. Big old love fest. I love (laughs) it. No, I just, I love having people that I admire and that I enjoy talking to on here. The energy is so much better and I hope it's infectious for you guys listening. We are taking this topic of business and we're gonna go in a little bit different direction than the Business Bites normally is. I'm normally hammering you guys with uh, legal and tax and all that boring stuff. We are gonna talk a little bit more about diversifying your business and all that goes into that so you guys can make more money and have more interest and passions in what you're already doing. Absolutely. And like when I ask my photographers in my community, and you probably hear this as well, the number one thing that they say is, oh, I need to get more bookings. I need to have more clients. And I think that is so short-sighted. So I am Mm -hmm. so excited to unpack this and dig into this with you because it is, it is some good stuff. It is good. And you know, and I should, I'm going to look at the statistics and I'll stick it on to the podcast show notes, which will be at rachelbranke.com. But they talk about they being like these uh, Forbes Entrepreneur Magazine and the big, the big names in media, when they're talking and assessing millionaires and billionaires, one of the key things that they state is that for people and businesses to get to millionaires and billionaires is through diversification, different streams of income. Hardly ever is it just from one specific income stream. And as a mother and as an entrepreneur myself, I freak out at the idea of only doing one thing and only getting money from one avenue. Oh my gosh, same. And especially, you know, when we look at our businesses, you know, I teach social media and a lot of times we have to remind people like you don't own social media. You cannot put all of your eggs in that one basket because at the end of the day, that's someone else's website that we're using. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, diversifying is not only a thing that brings us a little bit of comfort, but it's just smart strategically. Absolutely. You know, one of the things I've been seeing within the last few years as online education becomes more prevalent and just online influencers, and they're more in your face because you've got Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, whatever it is, Snapchat that's out there. But more and more people, I mean, girl, I don't, I can't even keep up with all the social media platforms. <laughs> all I think of when I think of Snapchat is the cute filters. Like, let's be honest, that's the priority right there. <laughs> I feel like a grandma because I'm like, how do I load Snapchat, Sonny? Like, I don't even know how to use it. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I have interns. I, there's a new app that's kind of coming out right now, and I texted all of my interns. I was like, hey. What do you guys know about this? Is this going to be a thing? And they were all like, well, I was like, okay, that's all I needed to know. Thank yeah, you. right, right. <laughs> well, and we'll watch it. And, and that's the thing is that I, these new things coming out. And one of the new things that all these influencers and online uh, personality brands are offering is teaching, teaching yeah. other business owners. Um, so what is your opinion on that? And why should creatives, not even just photographers or anybody in any industry, why should they consider adding teaching and education into part of their business plan and diversification plan? That's a, that's a mouthful, isn't it? I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys, it is so incredibly smart to add on a different stream of income. And as Rachel said, and Rachel, I was actually sitting here snickering as you were talking about the millionaires, because they say on average that the average millionaire has seven different streams of income. Look at her. She's got the statistics. I don't even have to go look it up. (laughs) I am such a nerd about data, but seven streams of income. So if I would just challenge you guys right now, look at your own business. Mm -hmm. How many different streams of income 
are you bringing in? Because when I, you know, speak to photographers, they say, well, I need to book more photo shoots. And what you really need to do is say, okay, so why? Mm -hmm. Like ask that question. This is, you know, this goes back to goal setting. Like, well, why do you want to book more photo shoots? Oh, because, you know, I want to be able to support my family. Okay, great. Why? Well, because my kids need to do this and this and this. Okay. Then why do you want to do photo shoots? Because that's how I get paid. Okay, but Mm -hmm. by saying that you can only do your craft or only or you just do this photo shoot or you only design, you know, floral, I don't know, archways or whatever it is that you're creating, if you just do that one thing, you're limiting yourself. Mm -hmm. So by opening it up and considering teaching, you are literally opening up the doors. And there are, you know, when it comes to online education, when it comes to in-person education, especially for us that are creatives, those of us that are creatives, we have a skill that people want to learn. Mm -hmm. You know, as adults, we, I used to teach art and I used to have elementary art and I would have parents come in and volunteer with our kids' classes. And there would be so many times I'd be doing a project and I'd have the parent look at me who was supposed to be helping and they'd be, um, is it, is it okay if I just sit and make this painting with the kids? Because it is intimidating to be creative. We, we've been taught mm-hmm. that there's a right and a wrong way to do it. And so as adults, to go to a fun class, a two-hour, a one-hour two class, learning how to bake a cute cupcake, learning how to take an amazing photo, learning how to design a floral um, spray for your front door, like those are the things that empower people and add value to their lives. And as you start to get older, and as you, as Rachel and I were talking before we went live, you know, you're looking at your kids and you're measuring the things in your life that have value. And these these little extrinsic things, these pretty things, these creative things, these are at the end of the day, what makes our days worth living. Mm-hmm. And so if you can be someone who, man, I'm like off on a tangent right now. I was going to say, we that, don't get this touchy feely on this podcast, but it's, yeah, it's good. It's, it's good. <laughs> This is weird. Do we need to have like a therapy session afterwards? But it matters, you guys. If you can enrich mm-hmm. people's lives, they are going to be coming back to you over and over and over again. And it might not just be for a workshop, but it could be to hire you to have that photo shoot or to have whatever whatever it is that you do offer otherwise. So it is just such a smart business move. So before we d- dig into more of the adding of teaching to as one of our income streams in business, right. what would you suggest... Because like for me, as you guys listening and Sarissa, you know, I am multi-passionate. Like there are so many things that I want to do in my business, but (laughs) infamous Pam has to tell me sometimes, okay, you can do that later. You have too much going on because I have a tendency to do, want to do everything, but then you kind of become spread too thin and nothing ever really gets driven forward. So what would your tips be? Be if someone's thinking right now as they're listening, oh, I would love to add teaching, but I don't know how I can manage one more thing. How can I really successfully implement this? So I would kind of go at this from two different ways, because this is a really big hesitation that a lot of people have like, oh my gosh, how can I add one more thing? And I get it. Our lives are busy, but here's the, here's the thing that I want you to consider when you are doing something like teaching, if you are doing a small group format, so let's say you have five people take a photography workshop with you and you charge each of those people a hundred bucks a head. And I'm just throwing out a number, not saying that's the number you should use. Maybe it is, maybe not, but you guys look at that. That is $500 that you just brought in. Let's say you teach in the morning and in the afternoon. That's $1,000 you just brought in in one day for just a few hours of work. So mm-hmm. the number one thing I want you to is kind of like shake your brain and say, you can't afford to ignore this. Mm-hmm. You, can't, you can't afford not to do that. So that would kind of be the first thing that I would say is like, all right, figure out why this matters and why you need to pay attention to. And then the second thing that I would say is look at your business and look at what it is that you offer in your specific strengths and then listen to your community. Mm -hmm. Because if you listen, they will tell you what they want to know. And one of my, you know, the first step that I would tell you guys to take as you're considering teaching any kind of teaching is do a survey, pull your audience. What is it that you already know? What would you like to know? What do you struggle with? What is your confidence in this? How would you, would you call yourself creative? And when you get those survey results back, you suddenly have all kinds of data because I think one of the biggest mistakes that people make, not the biggest, but one of them is that they're like, well, I'm just going to teach this because this is what I think people want to know. When at the end of the day, that couldn't be farther from the truth. So I think Mm -hmm. you have to find this place of combining what your clients want and need 
and what strengths and gifts you bring to the table as well. And you know, on top of that, I come from a little bit different perspective than I think majority of educators out there because nobody likes the legal topic because it's overwhelming or it's scary right. or they don't know what they want to know or need to know. So uh, I struggle with everything you just talked about right there because I want to serve the audience of what they want to know. But I also, it's my responsibility to step in and say, y'all, you're not going to like this part, but this is what you need to know. And some people listening may be in a field that's like that. So my piece of advice with that, um, especially when it comes to teaching, is to balance it together. Don't go completely the one direction, because I've tried it. Don't completely go one direction of saying, you have to know this. This is all I'm going to teach. You need to partner it with some of the more fun stuff. For example, what do a lot of people love to learn about? Marketing and social media. So for me, and I'm believe that I'm relatively good at it, even though I'm not well known for it. I present that and then I include the legalities and the not so fun stuff that people necessarily want to know, but they need to know with it. So it kind of all complements each other. Absolutely. And kind of going along with what you just said, it, I was, again, giggling. It's like, well, I'm reading your mind and you're reading mine. This is like absolutely crazy right now. But one of the things that I tell my my clients is, hey, when you're considering teaching a photography class, what are some of the things you have to have? And on that list of things, one of them is mimosas. And that sounds so silly, but I think a lot of us take ourselves way too, too seriously. Mm-hmm. We take it too seriously. And so if someone's coming to a class or they're looking to, you know, learn legal advice or get legal advice from you, that's intimidating and it's scary. And so if we take the time to say, hey, this isn't just like that other online class you saw or that that thing you saw for sale at a big box store. This is different. So come on in, get a mimosa. Let's get to know each other. Let's chit chat. You can ask me your questions. And when you break down those walls and actually start to play and have fun and disperse your content and educate and tell them those things that they probably don't want to know. They are so much more receptive to your message because you soften them up. So whether it's mimosas, whether it's chocolate, whether it's coffee or goldfish or Capri Suns, whatever it is that disarms the side note, I offer all of those things in my workshops, and every time the goldfish go first. Oh, little goldfish side note. are the best. Oh heck yeah! All the moms are sitting out there with their Capri Suns and goldfish. They're oh like, my god! <laughs> this is what this is what we normally have at home, and I'm stressed out, so I'm just eating what I normally eat when I'm stressed <laughs> out. I'm like, you do you, mama. But those little things provide that little bit of comfort mm-hmm. and that little bit of playfulness, and it breaks down those barriers, so people are not afraid to ask the hard questions, and they're more receptive when you have to give those hard answers. Does that make sense? It totally does so basically I've learned I need to get people drunk in order for them to listen to my legal talks there you go right Jill everything you need to know in a nutshell bam bam done episode over no (laughs) (laughs) all right so I think we've convinced people diversification good multiple income streams good get people comfortable I'm going to teach something that I'm knowledgeable because that's really important you have to have a good knowledge base in order to teach But how hard is it, do you think? Because I know that some people are natural-born teachers, others may be more introverted and are paralyzed by that, or some just aren't sure about their skill set. How hard is it to teach a class? So I think one of the things that it's really going to come down to is how humble can you be? If you are willing to admit, I don't know, let Mm -hmm. me get back to you. If you're willing to say, you know what, before class, I don't really know the answer to this, So I'm going to do some research and figure it out. I think that's the difference between the teachers that are successful and those that are not. The ones that are willing to say, you know what, I need to strengthen my knowledge base in this area. Or you know what, I only work with Nikons. I'm going to invite a Canon friend to come to class Mm -hmm. with me so that I've got someone else who can help me figure out all these different cameras. And someone who's not afraid. And I did this in the last class I taught two weeks ago. I sit in front of my class and they ask a question. And I said, you know what? I don't know the answer to that, but let me do a little bit of research and I'll follow up with you and let you know. Mm -hmm. If you are willing to be humble and to do the work before class, prepare your slide deck, to prepare your workbook, to figure out exactly what it is that you want to teach and how you're going to put it all together. If you're willing to do the work and you're willing to be humble, it's actually a lot easier than you may think. Um, And I know, like you said, the whole introvert thing, I'm married to an introvert. My kids are introverts. My best friends are introverts. Which always makes me wonder, like, how did you attract all of them? (laughs) Right. Like how, why do you all like me? I don't, I don't fully quite understand, but you know, as introverts, you know, one of the things that I've learned about the introverts in my life is that they like to think and mull things over and have the right words. And even for those of you that are introverts and the thought of standing in front of a class is terrifying for you, 
do the work beforehand. Mm -hmm. Literally have that workbook that you can flip through. It's almost, almost like you're reading a book. Don't lecture for the love of all things holy. Please don't lecture. Um, But you can flip through that workbook and you can have your slide deck and you can refer up to that and look at that. And this kind of becomes your place to have your perfect words that you've curated in your head already. Mm -hmm. You've already written them down and you can refer to them. So it's, it's about learning not only how your students learn best and what they need to know, but also how you can best present the information. I like to approach it more of like a discussion. And I know everyone has their own kind of teaching style. Um, I just Mm. came home from a large industry conference and I had the privilege of being able to teach a smaller class because normally I'm in the huge auditorium. I can't take questions. And I actually find that I prefer the questions and being able to say, okay, that topic's done. Do you have a question? And then move on. And, And I haven't always been able to do that. I used to get thrown in the very beginning if someone asked a question. But once I started framing it in my mind as a discussion, then it also allowed for the audience to feel like they were investing into the class as well instead of just taking. And any time that someone feels like they have skin in the game or a little investment, I don't. I need to look up this psychological study, but it's like when you have a conversation, and the more that one person talks about themselves, they think more highly of the conversation um, uh-huh. and of the person they are talking to. And the same thing goes in education. Whenever a student can give as much feedback or insight or lend some of their experience, helps them to feel better and more invested in the class, and it gives you, the instructor, a huge insight into more questions, examples to use for the future, how you can tailor your future classes I love I love and welcome like audience and student oh, discussion same. same when I teach my class I usually will take about six to ten people depending upon let's be honest how I'm feeling like oh yeah let's do a big person or let's no let's just do, keep mm-hmm. it at six people you know but I love that small group interaction and it it's exactly what you just said when you stand up and you lecture and you disperse information people are going to get some takeaways of course mm-hmm. but when they have a chance to apply what you've learned so maybe you teach a little bit and then you're like okay so I just taught you about aperture now go experiment with it. They're going to learn a whole lot more, but that next step, which so many people miss, and you kind of just touched on it, statistics show that those who help teach learn better than Mm -hmm. those that don't. So here's what I mean by that. So, you know, I taught my little segment on aperture um, and what that does to your photographs. I said, all right, here's what depth of field is. Go practice. You've got 10 minutes, go with your buddy, go practice around the room. And so I had one girl and she couldn't figure out this one thing. And for the life of me, I can't even remember what it was right now, but she's like, I don't know why this is happening. So I sat on the floor next to her. We worked with her camera. We figured it out. And then about 60 seconds later, someone walked up to me. They're like, hey, Sarissa, this thing is happening, and I don't know why. And I was like, oh, you know what? Hang on. Joni's going to teach you how to solve that problem. And Joni looks at me with these big old eyes, and she's like, "I'm what? And I was like, no, 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 girl. Think about what we just did. Listen to this question again. So the other girl reframes it, and Joni says, oh, okay. Did you look at this? Yes. Okay. Did you look at this? No. Ah, there's your problem. And she taught this other girl. And one of the things that I tell my students all the time is don't be afraid to ask the stupid, what you think is a stupid question. Don't be afraid of that. And don't be afraid to make mistakes because your mistakes are opportunities to learn. And I guarantee once you figure out what you've done, you'll never forget it. And Mm -hmm. you'll be able to teach someone else. You form those synapses, those connections in your brain, and they're not going anywhere. So I, I think that's one of the best is in small groups, welcome the questions, welcome the discussions, allow people to get on Google. We, I mean, we ask Siri all the time, Hey Siri, how do I do this? You know, and tell people to pull out their manuals because when you create a learning community, Mm -hmm. everyone learns and grows together. And let's be honest, you guys, that takes a little bit of the stress off of you. Oh, for sure. Because you have a moment to breathe. Mm -hmm. And that is tremendous when you're up there teaching. I think you need to have multimedia options for people so that they can learn whether or not they need to see it, whether or not they need to hear it, or whether or not they need to experience it. So I would definitely say you need to have some sort of workbook or worksheet for people to follow along. Definitely have some sort of PowerPoint slide or visual representation. And then an opportunity for learning activities built in so that people can actually get their hands on what it is that you're talking about um, and can actually apply it. So I would say that would be the first thing. Um, The second piece, the second thing that I think every teaching course needs to have, be it photography or not, would be some sort of nurturing. Mm -hmm. Um, Because before class, before people show up, there's going to be some questions, like the, the normal stuff. All right, well, where is this class? 
what should I bring? But a lot of times what I will do is because when people come to a camera class, like they don't even know what a lens hood is. They don't know like why a filter matters. They don't know why they should or should not format their memory card. And so I actually have like a 20 minute video that goes over all of that basic stuff before class. So I don't burn class time going over the basics for those people that already know it. I also let them kind of get to know me because they're watching me on video and they're already feeling disarmed. Like I've had people walk into class and be like, I feel like I already know you. <laughs> and I'm making sure everyone's coming in with the same basic knowledge. So when you nurture them a little bit and can anticipate their needs, just like you would for any type of photo shoot or anything that you would do for your business, that really helps grow your company and your, your word about marketing. Um, but in that third piece, I'm telling you, it's mimosas. It's the fun part. It's the <laughs> playfulness. You know, I tell people like, hey, grab your phone, watch Walk around the studio, find some cute little trinket and take a photo of it. And then we're going to take a photo of it again later or take a selfie of someone else making a silly face or, you know, we play, we have fun. And at the end of the day, that is what different, I think that's, that's the heart of it is you've got to find a way to differentiate your class from every other thing that's online. Because, you know, for me teaching a photo class, one of the, the questions or the struggles people have, they're like, well, I know if I go buy a camera at this big box store, they offer a free camera class and, and there's Google and there's YouTube. Why would someone work with me? And the thing is, is it's how you present your message. It's how you make them feel. It's how you package it all together. If you can make their life easier or better or simpler, you've got a client for life. Well, that boils down, this is going off of the path a little bit, but that boils down into who the client or the customer avatar is. Like for yeah. me, because I'm so busy, I'm willing to spend money for someone to deliver to me yes. one or two hours, tell me how to do this, as opposed to, yeah, it's free online, but the reality of me sitting down and Googling and finding it is probably next to none. You want to hear something crazy? Mm. So in that survey, I did, so I've, I, I'm a big data research person. Like I love numbers. I don't actually, I hate numbers. If I had to do our family budget, we'd be living in a pretty cardboard box. But <laughs> when it comes to research and making informed decisions, I get really geeked out about numbers. And so I did a survey about, you know, from photographers, like, hey, what are your fears in terms of teaching a class? But I also did a survey for new photographers. Um, and their prerequisites were you couldn't be a pro or an amateur um, and you couldn't have taken a class in the last five years. Okay. And so we asked them all these questions. And one of the questions that I asked them was, Hey, if you had to change your aperture on your camera, would you even know what button to push? Do you know what the percentage of people who said no was? Oh no. Like it was 79% of people said that they didn't even know what button to push. Not that they didn't know what aperture, not that they didn't understand depth of field. They didn't know what button to push. And I think we forget that they already have Google. They already have YouTube. They already have their manual. They already have these free classes, mm -hmm. but they're not using mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. They're not using them. So that, that argument, that fear, that concern mm -hmm. is a mute point because they are not taking advantage of it. So I guess, crazy? you know, and that's the thing I struggle with that as an educator myself. And when I am going to create a class, one of the very first things that I think about is how can I combat that? How can I make sure that people are actually going through the class? How can I make sure? Well, not because like getting them attracted, I feel like is easy. I feel like putting out the messaging and selling the class and I say easy, I know it's still a lot of work, but right. it's when create, I want to create a class so that people learn something from it, take away from it and can implement it. And I find, especially in the online sphere, maybe, you know, it's a little different when you're in brick and mortar, but I guess it's kind of the same. You don't want someone to sit and listen to you for an hour, engage, you do all this fun stuff, drink a couple of mimosas, and then when they go home, don't do anything more with it. And so oh, for me, when I create a class, I always try to think, how can I inspire them to not just learn, but to do X, Y, and Z after? Yes, 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 yes. And I think that's the biggest mistake. This would be my, the best tip that I could give you guys. You know, people look at the at class creation and we're like, we want to give them all of the things. But the reality is, in a one hour, two hour, even a full day course, you can't, mm -hmm. you simply mm -hmm. cannot. And if you try to overwhelm them with really high level content, you know, so many photographers, they're like, let me teach you about your light meter. Let me teach you about exposure. And they're still sitting there like, I don't, but what, what button mm -hmm. do I push? Mm -hmm. You know? So mm -hmm. you have to ask yourself, what is one goal I want my students to accomplish? What will make them at the end of this class, 
whatever, however long that is, at the end of this class, what is one goal my students can accomplish to feel that success? Yep. Because if they feel that success, number one, they're going to come back again. Number yep. two, they're going to tell their friends. And number three, I've just done something positive in the world that's not just about me. And it's leaving a legacy beyond my classroom, beyond my family, and beyond myself. And I think at the end of the day, that is something that makes us all feel good. I feel like I need to cue some like sentimental, emotional music now. Because you're good enough and you're smart <laughs> enough and don't got it, people like you. <laughs> but, it's, but it is true because really, you know, when this circles back around to anything in business and I fight this as, I guess it, well, it works for me. Let me say that as an attorney. Anybody can teach legal stuff. People come to me specifically because of how I teach it, because of the personality and the follow through that I'm going to have with them that they may not get from the attorney down the street. You know, uh, anybody can get the knowledge. Anybody can regurgitate something and teach you a skill. But it is really all about the experience and what comes before, like you're talking about prepping them before they come in the door teaching them while they're there, and then what are you going to do with them afterwards? Continuing yes. the community and the education. Um, and then, yes, it does end up coming back around that it serves me from the standpoint that they might buy into other products or services that I have. But like you said, it's about serving the person so that they can go then serve themselves or others as well. Hashtag preach. Preach it. All right. <laughs> this, my, my, I like, actually, I love the fact that we had this conversation. It's so funny that we did it on the podcast because it yeah. clarified some things that I have been trying to work with myself on the education that I offer. So I hope this helped you guys. I know that it did. It's a lot of information. Please feel free to come back and listen to it as many times as you need. Uh, so I am going to link all of Sarissa's stuff on her social links. She has Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, her workshops, which her workshops are amazing. I watch her Facebook Thanks, lives. Wow. She is full of information. Um, but you, <laughs> <laughs> like so full, but you guys can find all of this at rachelbreaky.com forward slash EPI 51. Five, one, um, And also iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, Google Play, wherever you guys are listening. Thank you. And thank you, Sarissa. Any last tips that you want to leave with them before we wrap up this bite for today? Oh my gosh. Thank you guys so much for having me. And no, just find your confidence, find your voice, stand on your two feet and say, you know what? I might not know how to do this now. But just like everything, everything is difficult before it's easy. So put the work in, put the time in, and it will pay off. Literally will pay off <laughs> tenfold down the road. Diversify, diversify. Awesome. Thanks, Sarissa. You guys, good luck. Thanks for joining Rachel on this episode of The Business Bites. For show notes, a list of recommended tools, or referenced episodes, you can find them at businessbitespodcast.com. Until next time.